Father, we thank you for walking with us in good times and in bad, for shelter and safe spaces. We thank you when we have more than we need and when we struggle to get by. We thank you for how your creation leaves us in awe wherever we look. We thank you through the adventures and the everyday routines. We thank you for friendships and family, for laughter, comfort, and warmth. We thank you for new beginnings and closed doors. We thank you for the times when we should build and when we should start over. As seasons change and we walk into an uncertain future, we cling to you, the one who holds it all in your hands. From beginning to end, from death to life, from shattered to saved, we thank you. Water 
We can't always rely on our feelings. We cannot. We have to rely on the Lord. He will see us through whatever we're going through. Let's continue to worship the Lord.
Blessings, Father God. I know we're all dealing with different circumstances and situations in life. We're all walking unique paths. We're all going up and down the hills and the valleys of life. our hope remains in you. Our trust must remain in you, Father God. As Pastor Brian said and, and, and we sang earlier, Lord, the circumstances of life, the situations that we find ourselves in is not really what matters. What matters, Lord, is what you say. You say we're greater than we realize we are. You say we're forgiven. You say you have plans for us. Lord, you say a lot of things that we need to take to heart and apply to our lives. God, let us not rely on this world on our society, on our neighbors or our co-workers or peers. But Lord, let us trust in you and listen to what you say. You are our hope. You are our future. You are our reason for living. You are our everything. just a couple of days past Thanksgiving, and I am very glad to see that we all survived that day where all diet plans go out the window and calories simply don't count. We all survived our eating frenzy, and I thought it would be very appropriate to share with you this morning my favorite Thanksgiving poem. Now, if you've been here for any length of time, you've heard it before, I've shared it uh, in the past, and I'm going to share it again this morning because I, I so enjoy this particular poem that I'm reminded of every year. Unfortunately, I'm usually reminded it right after my gluttonous binge, but nonetheless, it's my favorite poem. May your stuffing be tasty. May your turkey be plump. May your potatoes and gravy have nary a lump. May your yams be delicious and your pies take the prize. And may your Thanksgiving dinner stay off your thighs. <laughs> Very appropriate for those of us who had second, thirds, eighths, you know. Besides starting off the eating season, this is the time of year that we tend to be a little bit more reflective. We start to think about 
what this year has brought and, and what we've been through and all the different things that, that have happened over these last almost you know, 11 or 12 months. We think through this year, we think through our experiences, and then some of us will go so far as to compile a, a list of all the things we've enjoyed. Maybe even we, we've called it our top 10 list of things that we're thankful for. And some of them, I'm sure, are very familiar from one list to the next. You know, things like family and friends, or we talk about the home that we live in, the, the food that we eat, or the fact that we have a car to drive. <clears throat> All things that we are incredibly thankful for. And then there's, there's those rare occasions or those those fewer occasions when we get to think about being thankful for things like a wedding or a child or a, a grandchild being born, any of those different things. We, we put all of those ideas and those thoughts together. Some of the most favorite things of all come out of the mouths of our kids, especially when they're smaller and younger. One magazine article that I was reading put together a list of some things that kids are thankful for. Well, let me share just a few of them with you this morning. A little girl by the name of Erin is thankful for ceiling fans. <laughs> I don't know if she lives in a hot area or what, but she's thankful for ceiling fans. Allison is thankful that her brother is not a monster. Yeah. Aiden says he's thankful for shoes, getting new shoes, and people who make shoes. <laughs> Something going on with shoes there in his life. Huh? Molly says she's thankful for the Statue of Liberty. When asked why, she simply said, why not? <laughs> Natalie listed off a whole bunch of things, all these different toys that she had, but then at the end of her list, she said, I'm thankful for the vacuum. <laughs> no doubt to clean up after her toys, I guess. Three-year-old Lacey says, I'm thankful for dinosaurs and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> One more for you this morning. Genevieve, I like this. She says, I am thankful for snowmen and daddy, and oh yeah, quesadillas. <laughs> you noticed all the food I wrapped in there? Yeah. Thankfulness, if we have already heard and talked about this morning, is something that brings joy and laughter and happiness to our lives. We don't always equate that. We don't always put that connection together. But thankfulness makes a difference in who we are. It brings joy and laughter. It's also an incredibly important part of Scripture. It is very accurate for us to be scripturally thankful. It, it says it throughout the Word. One particular closing chapter that Paul wrote for us in his letter to the Thessalonians tells us to always be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Be joyful always, pray continuously, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And notice a couple key words there. Give thanks in all circumstances. You know, we shouldn't have to be reminded to express our thanksgiving. We shouldn't have to be told or it shouldn't have to be dragged out of us. We should give thanks. And when do we give thanks? When everything is perfect and the world is just the best place that it can be? No, even when we're down in the valley and at our lowest points and things are going terrible, we're supposed to give thanks at all times, in all circumstances. Scripture never says anything about giving thanks when things are going our way. It says give thanks in all things. If you read the King James, it simplifies that one little verse and says, in everything, give thanks. 
It's a very simple statement, but what a powerful one. In everything, give thanks. See, we don't get to separate good from bad, or or shall I say our concept of good from bad. We are simply told as believers in Jesus Christ to give thanks at all times. Now, if we can understand that, if we can grab onto that and grasp that concept, then we can realize that thankfulness is a huge part of worship. When we're worshiping, when we're praising, when we're praying, when we're spending time with the Lord, when we're lifting up His holy name, thankfulness is a huge part of that. It expresses our trust in Him, our trust in His sovereignty, no matter what the situation is that we're in. No matter what this year has been. I'll be honest with you, 2020, everybody talks about 2020 being such a bad, terrible, horrible year. In a lot of ways, personally, I got to tell you, 2021 has been worse for us. You know, the pandemic aside, 2021 has been a lot of things going on in our lives that we've had to deal with. But no matter what any of those are, our job is to be thankful. Our responsibility is to be thankful. So we're going to look at just a handful of items this morning to put on our thankful list. Now, these are not things that we might typically think about, not things that probably jump into our head the minute someone talks about being thankful, but these are very important pieces of being thankful, especially when it comes to worship. The first one is, Let's be thankful for faith. Thankful for faith. See, we are all sinners. Sitting in this room, watching from home, we are sinners. Sinners in need of a Savior. And it is through faith that we are saved. It's the avenue of our salvation. See, no one can earn their way to heaven. No one can buy their way into God's presence. We are saved by grace through faith, according to Ephesians 2.8. And then again, those words are echoed in Galatians 2.26. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. It's our faith that gives us that avenue to salvation. No matter what we do, we can never, never make it there on our own. I don't care what title you hold. I don't care if you have an an associate's, a bachelor's, a a master's, a PhD. I I don't care if you hold the record for PhD. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care if you have a dollar in your wallet or a couple million in your account. There is nothing, nothing that you can do or earn or achieve or have that brings you to the point of salvation. We are saved by grace Through faith. No ladder to climb. No position to obtain. By grace. Through faith. Now, I'm going to tag on here and say, praise God that we don't have to earn our way. Because if any one of us had to earn our way to heaven, we'd be doomed. Just that simple. We are sinners. We are incapable of earning our way to heaven. We cannot be good enough. We cannot do enough. We cannot give enough away to get there. It is by grace, through faith alone, that we are saved. So thank God for faith. Secondly, let's thank God for His Word. The Word of God, that incredible 
piece of literature, book that we have that has been designed and put together and crafted just for us. The first five books in Scripture are known as the Pentateuch. They were written by this guy named Moses. Maybe you've heard of him. In those books, <clears throat> Old Testament texts now, but in those books, Moses, led by the Holy Spirit, wrote words of encouragement, words of instruction, words of history, all for our benefit. There is a couple of little verses that jump out to me regularly when I read through those uh, that text. See, just before his death, just before the Israelites went into the promised land, he pens some words that are meant specifically for the Israelites and everything they're about to encounter, but they're words that have reached generation after generation and are incredibly important for us to grab onto and hold onto tightly. I've read them many a times standing right here. And I'm going to read them again this morning because if we can, folks, if we can understand this concept, what a huge difference it makes in our life. Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47. Take to heart the words I have solemnly declared to you this day so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of the law. Why? They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. By them you will live long in this life on earth that God has given you. Those are my added words, obviously. They are not just idle words for us. They are our life. Think about that. These, do you understand the importance of God's word in those statements? His word goes on to tell us that nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Another staggering thought for us to, to truly comprehend, if we would, you know, when we make those wrong choices or, or do those silly things or, or, rebel against our parents or God or anything else. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. He has given us His Word to follow. And in those infallible, perfect pages, He has laid out every piece of instruction that we will ever need in the course of our lives. It contains the answer to problems we don't even know we have yet. Problems we have not even encountered yet. Now, I know some of us have walked through situations and we're going, God just isn't telling me. God just isn't talking to me. God is just silent on this. Why isn't God speaking to me? Maybe you're not listening. Maybe it has nothing to do with him speaking as much as it does to you or me listening. Maybe we're not asking God the right question. Maybe when we pray, our prayer is more like a list of demands than it is an open heart of God, do what you want to do in and through my life. God's Word is infallible. God's Word is perfect. God's Word contains no errors. God's Word has the answers that we need. So if we're not getting them, not hearing them, not understanding them, who do you think's at fault? Not God. It's not His perfect Word. Perhaps it's our mindset or our thoughts. Thank God for His Word. The next thing that is on our thankful list this morning maybe doesn't sound so much like anything we'd want to be thankful for. But nonetheless, it's something we are told to be thankful for. That would be our daily struggles and our sufferings. 
Now, those of you that have been in Sunday school the last several weeks know exactly where I'm going with this. This should be pretty fresh in your hearts and in your minds. God tells us to be thankful for those difficulties. Why? Because it's through those difficulties that we are built up and matured and our relationship grows and develops in our Savior. Again, go back to the Word that has the answers. We'll find it in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Seems pretty straightforward and simple, doesn't it? You know, we as human beings don't understand why one person suffers and somebody else seems to avoid all problems and issues and sicknesses and everything. We don't understand that. We don't get that. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us. But you know what? Again, that's not our job. It's not our job to say we can justify it or we can understand it or, or we can make it right. It's our job to trust in the Word of God. It's our job to trust our sovereign Savior and to believe Him no matter what we are experiencing. The world, they would tell us the completely opposite. There are some religious that would even tell us the opposite. Well, you're sick because you don't have enough faith. That is not a right answer. That is not a correct statement. Our health, our sickness is not hinged on the amount of faith we do or don't have. We need to trust our Savior and understand, again, according to His Word, He can bring about good in all situations. In fact, for the believer, it says he will bring about good through all situations. Now, that doesn't mean every situation is good. Understand the difference? Bad things do happen. We do walk through uncomfortable times. But God can and will bring about good through those different circumstances, through those situations, through those difficult trials that we face. And those things will help us to persevere according to His Word. I understand it's not easy to walk through those things. And you're listening to what I'm saying and you're saying, well, Pastor Kurt, you have no sympathy. You have no mercy whatsoever. You're right, I don't. That's a whole other story doesn't matter if I sympathize or if I have mercy or even if I understand. The truth of the matter is God will get you through. God will bring about the good. God will make a way. None of that hinges on me. None of that hinges on you. It hinges on putting our hope and trust and faith in our God. And if our attitudes will be right through those trials and difficulties, God can do some amazing things. Absolutely amazing things. In fact, let me give you a little example this morning of something that God can do when an attitude is right, even in the midst of a horrific trial. Before she even turned one year old, Alex Scott was diagnosed with cancer. Obviously horrific news for anybody, any parent, any individual to hear this one year old being diagnosed with a horrific illness. But by age four, Alex had decided she was going to do something about it. And she was going to put together a lemonade stand. The purpose of her lemonade stand was to raise money. 
So she did that. She started working on putting this stand together to reach her neighbors, to reach her neighborhood, to tell others about her goal, which was to raise money for childhood cancer research. And not just her cancer research, but cancer research for any child. See, she had made a lot of friends in her time in the hospital, and they were all dealing with their own different forms of cancer. Unfortunately, Alex's was not getting any better. But she was adamant about this lemonade stand, and she continued to work and help raise money and help fight this battle. And it's because of her attitude in her horrific trial and situation that a difference was being made. People caught wind of what she was doing. They drove by, they saw her stand, her story got out, people told other people. And in one incredible day, selling lemonade, she raised $2,000 to go towards cancer research. $2,000 in a day. Again, unfortunately, her cancer continued to get worse. But she continued to push forward, getting the message out, trying to make a difference. Her heart's desire was to help others so that maybe they would have a chance or an opportunity to grow up and see a different life. Her lemonade stand grew from just one little stand in her neighborhood to more than 20 across the country. Different people who caught on to her desire. Sadly, at just eight and a half years old, Alex died. She passed away from her cancer. But two weeks before that happened, she saw one of her dreams come true. Two weeks before her final day, her children's cancer research fundraising idea had reached a million dollars. And it still wasn't over. From there, her parents formed a foundation, the Alex Lemonade Stand Foundation. And to date, they have raised over 200 million dollars all to go to cancer research they have been they have funded a thousand different projects in 150 different institutions and they have helped hundreds of other children and their family in their fight against cancer all of that happened because one little girl chose not to get mad. She chose not to be depressed or disappointed or yelling or fighting, but she chose in the midst of her trial and struggle and affliction to make a difference, to have the right attitude and to change literally the world because of the way she was choosing to live and function. God has a plan for you and I as well. And no matter what it is we're going through, no matter where we're at on that hill or valley climb, He has something He wants to accomplish in and through our lives. And if we will let Him do that, not only will we grow and mature, but we can see countless lives around us changed as well. Thank God for the trials that we endure and go through. One more for our list today. We need to be thankful for the Holy Spirit. We believe in a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And according to Genesis chapter 1, the Holy Spirit has been active ever since the creation of the world. 
Holy Spirit was not something new when Matthew started writing. The Holy Spirit has been active from day one. Triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Throughout the Old Testament, we read about people being moved and inspired by the Holy Spirit. They could not have done what they did. They could not be the leaders or have the insight or the understanding that they did without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in their lives. A fact that even the, the New Testament uh, declares, because it talks about Abraham's faithfulness and so on, and none of that is possible without the Holy Spirit's empowerment. Long before Acts, long before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts, God used people to heal and do miracles and to speak truth. And none of that could have been done if the Holy Spirit was not active and involved. Again, from day one, from the beginning of time. Today, the benefit that we have is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been active since day one. But it's through Christ's death and resurrection and ascension that we now have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He takes up residency in our lives. 1 Corinthians six nineteen. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? He is within us as believers in Jesus Christ. Jesus very clearly, through Scripture, through the Gospels, Jesus very clearly said that when he left, a counselor would come. What he was speaking of there, that counselor, was the Holy Spirit. And if you ever read through the Gospel of John, you will see that repeated over and over. Jesus talks about the coming of the counselor. John 14, 16, and 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. John 14, 26. By the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. John 15, 26. When the counselor comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. John 16, 7. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit today that gives us strength and endurance and hope. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit today that helps us to go through those trials that are beneficial for us and building to us. It's the Holy Spirit today that leads us to the Word of God and the truth that lies within that Word. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us strength and endurance to deal with this thing that we call life and all of its ups and downs and goods and trials. It's the Holy Spirit within us that gives us the everyday confidence that we need to keep running the race. To keep running. Thank God for the Holy Spirit If we haven't grabbed onto this concept by now, thankfulness is not an option for us as believers. It's a requirement. It's something we are told to do. Be thankful. Give thanks with gratitude and joy in our hearts. It is not an option. It is a requirement. And when we learn to be thankful, God will use us to change people around us as well as to change our own hearts and minds. Whether we realize it or understand it or not, thankfulness changes our relationships with people. It changes our attitudes. It helps those attitudes to remain positive. 
Thankfulness even affects our health, our physical health. There are so many that could learn to grab onto that concept. Thankfulness, gratitude can affect positively our physical well-being. It cultivates humility. It promotes generosity. It displays God's character within our lives. It's contagious. And I could go on and on and on listing the benefits of thankfulness. There is not one person within the sound of my voice this morning, loud or memorex, I don't care. There's not one person that is hearing these words this morning that shouldn't have pages and pages and pages of things to be thankful for. Simple fact that God allow us to live in this country, in this nation, that alone is massive. There are people all around the globe this morning that would literally give anything to change places with us. Literally. We are such a blessed people. Dare I even say a spoiled people. We are so incredibly fortunate. We need to grab that understanding and run with it. Because there, again, is not one person in the sound of my voice that doesn't have a substantial amount of things to be thankful for. Let's not worry about cars or homes or clothes or any of that stuff. But start thinking about all the gifts that God has given you. Talents and abilities. What He has taught you over the last year or two what He has provided for you, and how He has provided it for you. Maybe what miracles you personally have experienced over the last year or so, whether they were in your life or whether you saw them manifested in somebody else's life. Freedom is an incredible thing to be thankful for. How many things has God blessed us with? How many things has God done for us? How many ways can we be thankful to our God? Stew on that. Chew on that. Think about that for a little bit. And then start writing them down. And when you start writing them down, post that list on your refrigerator or your bulletin board or right in front of your computer monitor or next to your laptop, or on your, post it somewhere where you can look at it all the time and say, my word, would you look at all these things that God has done for me? Would you look at all these ways he has blessed me? Man, I'm really having a hard time today. Things are really tough to, wait a minute. Look at what God has done for me. Look at how God has blessed me. Gratitude. Thankfulness, it is such a huge part of our lives. When trouble comes, remember what He has done. Remember what He has provided or brought us through. And in all things, give Him thanks. It will change your life. Father God, we give You glory and honor and thanks this morning. Lord, I acknowledge myself, top of the list, we don't always remember to be as thankful as we should. We don't always remember to express our gratitude for you, for all that you have done and provided and blessed and and made a way for us. We we don't always think that way. God, I, I pray that you would forgive us in that. But more importantly, I pray that you would change the way we view things. And we would begin to understand that every moment of every day of every part of our lives is the right moment to be thankful. Not the fourth Sunday of November every year, but every single moment of every day of our lives to express our gratitude, our appreciation, our, our, our hope to you 
and to thank you for every piece of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ, His Son. so grateful for all that you've done the big things the little things things that we've seen and those we've not seen lord just give us a grateful a grateful heart in your name amen god bless you all